All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to Flight's journey building and growing an open source community. Flight is an LF AI and data incubating project. Katina and I will be uh, presenting to you today. We'll be starting with introductions, um, what is Flight, a bit about the open source community, and then spend most of the time on the struggles of building an open source community. We will wrap up with uh, what we plan for the future before taking questions. As for introductions, I'm Sandra. I'm a bit um, unconventional because I come from a different type of engineering background. I studied construction engineering and earned a master's of environmental engineering. But the beginning of my career was in the water treatment industry. When it was time to have a family, I decided to stay home with my children and instead um, volunteered at their schools, ran their Girl Scout troops, and um, helped our community managing things like early childhood programs and some adult learning programs. I also joined an interfaith and outreach um, committee for uh, planning events. For, and all this was about, um, for about 10 years. When it was time to go back to work, um, um, I looked at some certificates at the University of Washington, starting with a technical writing certificate. Um, I TA'd some content strategy classes and then um, earned a UX and visual interface design certificate just last month. Um, I slowly found myself um, going into the world of conference support and social media marketing for two um, UX conferences, um, Convey UX and UX Writer, which in turn brought me to Union AI, the team behind Flight, just in March of this year. I started off as a technical writer and then now uh, I'm in the uh, marketing department as a marketing content manager. Hand over to Caden. Thank you, Sandra. This one? Can you hear me, guys? No. Okay. Yeah, hey, um, so first of all, good morning. Um, my name is Ketan, um, and uh, I guess the picture over there t sums up my recent few months. Uh, it's very hard to get a photo with all four of us. I have a two-month-old at home and a two-year-old, uh, All uh, and the two-month-old was born in pandemic. Um, and so, yeah, this is the only picture I could find for four of us. Um, but, uh, I am here because um, Flight is a project that I started at Lyft about five years ago. Um, and I have, for the longest period, probably been the community manager slash evangelist of some sort on the project while doing my daily duties at Lyft. Um, and then earlier this year, I left Lyft to start a company that focuses on Flight and, and you know, related products. So um, I'll add some color to basically Sandra's story here. I, I'll just essentially give you a little bit of a background and history of how flight evolved and so on, and then look at the community aspects and, and uh, wherever we you know, put color into some various struggles that we had. Uh, just a little bit of background on myself. I'm a software engineer, 15 years. I've uh, been a software engineer, more maybe now. Um, I still write code, I love writing code. Uh, but uh, the hardest thing that I've done, probably, besides a lot of personal stuff, like that would be building a community. And that's why uh, I couldn't find a good resource on, on sharing the, the troubles of building a community, and that's why we decided to compile this together. Um, from the industry point of view, I've worked on, at, uh, my recent job was at Lyft before that, worked on cloud infrastructure, mapping, was at Amazon for a long time. Um, and also uh, did high frequency trading, banking. So yeah, went across the gamut. And, and that's where you know, the need for flight I saw like across many years and that's why we built it. So before we jump into the community aspect, yeah, we, we all need to get acquainted with the product itself. So let's talk a little bit about flight, just very quick. Um, flight is essentially, uh, a workflow automation platform that allows uh, users to forget about the machines, write the code, the business logic, and let it run somewhere. So it's uh, in the in the vein of the new world. It's like a serverless orchestration platform you, within an organization. You operate it like a central service. Um, it comes with uh, the classical distributed systems architecture, where you have a control plane, data plane, and so on. Um, uh, also. It is built on top of Kubernetes. Um, it, so it's 
that's the serverless component essentially. And uh, with a heavy focus on reproducibility and uh, replayability for, and recoverability within the systems. Because uh, these are the pieces that we saw were missing within the machine learning landscape, along with like understanding of types and parameters and so on. So given the, the feature set, it's very suitable for machine learning and data processing applications. Um, and we, we'll go through like how we actually evolved even the tagline for the project. Uh, it was developed at Lyft about five years ago, um, and uh, we were fortunate to work with uh, other thought leaders within the space, including Spotify, Free Nouns, Triveworks, and many others, uh, and essentially come up with the uh, project. This was it was contributed to Linux Foundation earlier this year, maybe I think February. Um, yeah, and and since then, we were able to really focus on the the open source journey for the product. I, I said a lot of things about Flight, but where does it really fit in, right? Uh, use, it's an orchestration platform, so it's orthogonal to really the use cases, but we, we, decide, we primarily focus on some use cases. And those use cases uh, rely heavily on, on data and machine learning uh, processing. So in this diagram, essentially the purple components is, is where Flight would directly be applicable. Uh, we have seen people apply it to other places, but these are the, the natural fit for Flight. So, uh, if you have a data warehouse on the left-hand side, the ETL or the transformation process that gets data into your data warehouse. Um, and, and once you have data in your warehouse, you want to train, build features, uh, do model monitoring, um, or do batch inference, like fits in beautifully in those places. Uh, but before we you know, understand the journey, which is, I think the most interesting journey has been the last one year in Flight's life, but let's see the history of Flight uh, or in the, before the open source, right? A lot of work went into Flight before it was even open sourced. Um, it was born in, I think I want to say November 2016 over a weekend. Uh, it didn't even have a name then, right? Like as every newborn is born, just born uh, out of the need instead of uh, having a mom and dad, they were just born because the need that a team essentially at Lyft wanted to deliver a product. Um, and so it was not built in isolation because we wanted to build a product. It was built because we wanted to actually solve our problems. Um, so I was leading a team that uh, was responsible for one of the most critical metrics in, at Lyft, uh, and that was the ETA. Uh, an ETA essentially is when you open up the app, you see, oh, three minutes for a car to come or 20 minutes to reach somewhere, right? That's extremely critical in two ways. One, it tells the user how much, how further away the car is from them. And based on that, they decide whether to actually go ahead waiting for this car or you know, switch to another app. Uh, so it's a very critical metric for conversion, the, or, or not metric in this case, actually a measure for conversion. And, and, the, and the second one is actually the, ETD, which is the time to destination. And that's very critical because it, it converts to the upfront fare that we charge, uh, or that Lyft charges, and hence actually directly affects the bottom line and the top line. So very, very critical numbers. Um, they look like simple numbers, but there's a lot that goes behind it. Um, and so I was uh, the person in charge of actually making sure the infrastructure and the the product really works for ETA. So we, uh, when, I, when I joined the team, we were doing all kinds of funny things. We were, we were running models on laptops and, and we were actually, there was a person who would just like orchestrate things and, um, and startups, you know, it was like for six years ago. So it was okay to do those things, but it was not scaling, right? It's obvious that it didn't scale. And we had terabytes of data that we wanted to process. And we wanted to do new things. We wanted to actually analyze road traffic and use that to you know, work on things. So uh, at that point, we looked around. And because of my background, I was like, there must be something that does you know, simple workflow automation of some sort. And we can like, you know, build things around it. And we found something. We, there was one thing around that was called Airflow. We used that, hacked it up. Soon we realized it doesn't really work for these use cases, but we still continued hacking it, hacked it to a point that we could deliver our things. And, and as success is, right, like you deliver something and other people just start saying like, oh, can I use that thing that you built so that I can deliver my own product? And there was another team. 
And that's when it dawned upon us that, no, 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 hold on. This was not built for being a, like a platform. And it was actually run without blood, sweat, and tears. And if I add maybe a team of four, trying to do that for another team would just you know, completely dismantle the team. Um, so that time we wrote a small paper that said, this is uh, the goal of this. Like, you know, we could build something like this in the future that could solve a company's problems. And a company, we, we were not thinking about open sourcing or anything. We were just thinking about Lyft. And you know, most people said, well, that's, this is not, you cannot build this. This is just crazy. Um, and so we, that's a challenge. And it, engineers love challenges. And so we got a, another engineer with me. Two of us sat together, down together. And we, in August of 2017, we actually launched the um, first version of Flight. Again, no name till then. Or there was some weird name. I forget. It's cool model builder platform or some things like that. Uh, and uh, another team was able to deliver a model. In, in, and they have not been able to do this for five quarters in a row uh, because of the amount of data they had and the, the complexity in the model. And that led to you know, word of mouth spread. And then October 2017, more people started using it. And, and we launched uh, uh, experiments in production, and they were successful. And you know, suddenly the, the thing that we had built now in two months was adopted by 15 teams in seven months uh, and with driving critical business revenue products. So uh, that led us to think, oh, hold on, there's something here. And I think the word reached out to other companies. They, they talked to us. We had a lot of open conversations with a lot of different folks. And finally, we decided to really rebuild it and in, from an open source point of view. And the reason why we decided to go open source is because we realized that the ROI for us as at Lyft building it was just not there. Like we were a small team of five engineers um, and running about uh, serving about 500 engineers in the company uh, on a weekly basis. Um, it would be extremely hard for us to maintain this, and we wanted like essentially to work with other like-minded uh, smart people in the world to actually improve the product. Um, so that's when we open sourced it at KubeCon and. December 2019, and thus begins the journey of our in open source. I call it the time of dawn. That's the I didn't I didn't find a very good symbol for dawn. It, so I put a pulp. But Jan 2020, I'm like going to take the holiday month of December as you know, kind of a no up. But Jan is really when we wrote our first blog, and that's open source. And and uh, it seems soon now. <laughs> But it felt long. Uh, about in a few months, Spotify and uh, Freenome decided to join us and partner with uh, us, and they uh, they became uh, top level partners for Flight. And soon, uh, USU joined in, and some other companies. And we and at this time, pandemic was happening, and the world uh, was changing. And and uh, for me personally, things were changing. And at Lyft, also, like my my focus on this product was lower because I was leading. An entire platform, um, and I thought that there's a lot more to give in this product, and that's when I decided to separate from Lyft. Started a company called Union, uh, and that was in like early this year. And uh, we we focused squarely on open source, and we have now can proudly say that we have at least ten plus organizations constantly collaborating and contributing to the project with lots of contributors. Um, we still think that it's really, really early days in building a product. We know where we are saying that it's a, we've like, you know, hit it out of the, out of the park, but we think we had, uh, we've learned a lot along the way. Um, it's, the nature of the product is such that it thrives on integrations. And um, integrations are amazing to build an open source, not community, but like an open source uh, project that people want to work with because it's not just one product then. It's like multiple products that are all helping each other, you know, trying to win. And this is needed in open source. We need to stop like building isolated boundaries and come together and essentially build products. Um, yeah, so that's that slide essentially. But um, let's, we, we talked a lot about the product now. Let's talk about the open source community. So when we, when we started about two years ago, we didn't really formalize this, and we're slowly formalizing this. But we, we started with a set of values that we want to build the community with. And, and just like a company, values are essential even in a community. 
And we took a different approach. We, we decided that our number one value is going to be customer obsessions and customer satisfaction, which is weird, right? Which is like in open source, what's a customer? That's the question that people will ask. But yes, the customer is anybody who's trying to use, your, use a product. But then who's serving it? So there has to be some set of people who are dedicated to the product for the product to work. That's one. And then there has to be the community. And almost slowly, people emerge from different companies and they start working together. And they really care um, about who feels how about the product. And the more you, you know, build it, that's what builds customer obsession. Um, so I think that's the number one thing that we've learned at least um, that works. Um, we also wanted to build a community that's really open and inclusive. And again, it's because if you look at the product, it's based on Kubernetes. And it's targeted towards data scientists and data engineers. Many times I've seen questions in, my, in the Slack channel, where like, what's a container? And it's completely, like for people who are using Kubernetes, this was like, yeah, it's like, yeah, I understand. Kubernetes is like levels above containers. But for many, many people out there, they don't, they've never used containers. And so that's where it starts, you know, inclusivity here doesn't really mean person, race, creed. It means anybody who's needing uh, any sort of knowledge that some other folks have and they don't, we want to bring that together. And so we want to be inclusive to anybody who comes into the community and be open in sharing all our knowledge. The other thing is that, you know, uh, we, when we're building the product, because we are having businesses really critically depend on the product, we, we care on reliability. We care about reliability more than features. We, of course, we'd love to build features. We are engineers, you know, we love to build new features in there. And the community loves to add features. They always request features. But the priority, the way we prioritize things within the community, we always put reliability a little up. And we're like, hey, this, this, this feature might affect the reliability, so we push it down. Um, and uh, another thing, um, and union.ai, this is the company that we started. We started with the goal that we are going to build, we, we are not going to take things away from this open source project. We are going to add whatever we can to the open source project, not really build open core, but really build a good open source project. And then offer meaningful uh, reasons why people could migrate to such a thing. And, and those could be just because they don't have enough infrastructure, uh, folks. And, and Another thing that we, we realized when we were building this, because of the set of people who were trying it out, they belong to different cloud companies. Um, the cloud is becoming a slow lock-in, and open source is a way out of it. And so we, we were like, we, we want to make sure that you know, cross-cloud support is always at the top level. So these were the values that we started with. And, when, uh, and for this preparation of this talk, what I did is I reached out to the community, and I said, can you share some some of your uh, comments or concerns or, or you know, feedback. Uh, and, and I said, of course, you know, if you're good, then I would put it on a slide. Uh, and I was, it was, I was humbled, and it's, it's overwhelming how people came up with. And as this is for a conference, most people actually came up with positive things. Um, so I, I have a bunch of feedback over here. I'm not going to read through all of them. But these are from various different companies who who are part of the community. And I couldn't actually fit everybody's feedback. That's how overwhelming it was. And that makes me feel I'm proud of being part of this community. But I'll, I'll quickly go through the themes of uh, the feedback. Why, uh, and the overwhelmingly positive feedback is because people really care about reliability. They, they like when open source projects don't break them. Right, you know, and, and this is, happens more often than not, where you know, a new release of the project, boom, broke all of your existing things. And like, okay, what do I do with my existing stuff that's running in production? So we try very, very hard not to break people. Uh, so, the, and I think we see that in the feedback. That doesn't mean we haven't broken. We, it, it's software. We will sometimes figure out regressions, but we are very quick to jump and fix on it. Uh, the other thing is, this is open source. People love, you know, and we're in the modern 2021 world. Slack is everywhere. Like you just want to quick responses to things. So people love, love quick responses to questions that are blocking them. Um, and so we try to answer whenever possible. And, and I think overall it rubs on the community and the entire community jumps in and helps and answers things. Uh, the other thing is just help on when new people come in and like how do you get them onboarded. 
Um, and you know, documentation is extremely important, I think. But documentation is a continuum. It takes a long time to really build. Like for, especially for a hard project, right? Like for example, oh, you need to wait to deploy to GCP, to AWS, to Azure. It's, it's kind of impossible to get that all right. So that's where community members come in and they start helping. Uh, and <laughs> another thing that I've learned is, you know, community is a cycle. Uh, people join a community when there are more people in the community. So how do you really, you know, this chicken and egg problem? Uh, so, you know, some of these themes that we see over there, you know, people, and they'll be like, oh, I joined the community because the community was big. Um, another thing is, um, you know, absolutely open. I, I think people will come up with great ideas and crazy ideas, and you should be open and take the feedback. And I think we, as a community, love critical feedback. So critical feedback, actually, nobody's given that weirdly here because they knew it was for a conference. But uh, critical feedback actually has helped the product a lot more. And of course, uh, our docs were horrible, and we'll see, like, you know, um, Sandra will go over uh, some of the learnings that we had with our docs, and, and you know, people are now talking about docs, which actually tells me that we are going in a positive direction. And then, yeah, and, and roadmap, because roadmap is the reflection of what people are requesting and what's actually happening. And so they really care about changes in the roadmap and evolution. With this, I will hand over to Sandra to essentially talk about the struggles as of us building a community. Thank you, Kaito. All right, so um, with the majority of the past couple of years being um, remote, let's start with our social media journey. So as Kaito had mentioned, the uh, Slack community was slowly building in September 2019 while flight was still at lift. It was released in November 2019. So flight, it's GitHub repos, Twitter presence, as well as a YouTube channel. And flight was announced um, at the North America 2019 KubeCon. A few months later in May, we started a Google Groups um, group, I guess. And our first, um, as we call it, flight OSS sync up was held over, Ju over Zoom in June of 2020. Until now, these sync-ups are happening every other week on Tuesday morning specific time. They typically include 10 to 20 members of the community plus um, the rest of the team behind flight. So fast forward to January 2021, we started to think, how do we um, increase our presence? How do we grow? Let's look at some stats. So we started with Google Analytics, and then um, in the first, in the second quarter of 2021, Flight joined LFAI and Data as an incubation project. Um, I'll want to highlight that second quarter, which is in purple here. I'll keep referring to that quarter um, as the presentation goes on. So in about, um, we decided to do something with our numbers. Say, how do we get better? How do we improve? Um, uh, what we're seeing here. So we started um, a discussion group um, on LinkedIn. We um, published a flight blog. Uh, we started to form a bit of a community on GitHub discussions to supplement our Slack community. Uh, we also started to improve our YouTube SEO. Uh, and how we did that is previously all of our sync ups had been uploaded to YouTube as um, as a video titled the flight sync up and just the date there. What we needed to do was to put the topic and the speaker's name on the title. So when you search for a topic, you, you can find those videos starting to come up. Also, if we had a few topics being discussed in the one meeting, we started to break those into separate YouTube videos to have um, more um, specialized um, searching. Um, and we also started a documentation revamp. So all that was happening in that second quarter of this year. To date, we have about 540 um, members on Slack. We have 190 followers on Twitter and about 150 um, Google uh, group members. Sorry, I think that's my mic every time I move. I think that's your necklace. Oh, it's my necklace, oh, okay. All right. So to look at some improvements, we um, looked at some quantitative and qualitative metrics. Um, 
Some of the numbers we could measure included the number of followers on Slack and Twitter, um, some detailed Google Analytics, GitHub Stars was one of them, and user retention. Some of other non-measurable metrics included um, contributor and custom, um, contributor feedback, morale on Slack, contributor and customer testimonials, and just general community engagement. But before we could go ahead with anything, uh, we needed to do something about our getting started, which is what Caden will talk to us about. Yeah. Um, we're going to do the stack teaming sometimes in between. Um, so I guess uh, getting started here refers to the, the way you start with the software project. Uh, and yeah, it's critical. It's like it's, I think it's the make or break for an open source project. And for amazingly successful projects, usually you'll invariably find that it's really easy. And sometimes it's not even related to the, to the depth and, and the, um, I don't want to say the quality of the project, but like, uh, like on the number of features, it, I don't think it, that really matters. If it's easy, if it solves one specific problem, it really helps. And our getting started was horrible. Like, you know, probably a year ago, we, we would tell, this is the first thing. When a user comes to the docs website, they'll say like, all right, to get started with flight, first go get a Kubernetes cluster. All right, and then if you have a Kubernetes cluster, now let's in, in, install Postgres or get Postgres somewhere. Oh, and then yeah, set up ingress, and now learn about containers, and then finally go to you know Python, and it like, doesn't work. Then earlier this year, maybe March or sometime, we we did we kind of inverted this model, and we're like, what if we you know make our the Python library, which is more accessible to the set of users that we really care about, make that work almost end to end and well within their uh, what they want to achieve. And so the first thing was pip install flight kit, and you can get started with it, and it runs. Now that you have that, next thing you do is, oh, does it work for you? You ask that question. If it does work for you, let's scale. But even scaling has to be really, really fast. So that means, what does that mean? You, you need to be able to try it out in this real world. Like we, we did the pip install flight kit, and we're, people still were like, no, no, I want to install a Kubernetes server somewhere. And like, hold on, where are you going to install a Kubernetes server? That matters because there are like cloud providers that are on-prem. It's just everything differs. And so we actually decided to come up with one Docker container that contains an entire flight installation, including Kubernetes and, and, and the entire stuff. And so that you can just say Docker run one thing and it, it runs. We found that even that was not great. So we actually ended up writing a CLI that allows you to start that we call it the sandbox environment, very quickly, wherever you want, locally or some, somewhere, to try out flight. And that, we think, has really helped users understand uh, how to get started with it and, and try out flight. Because otherwise, we would lose people even like, you know, install ingress, all right, bye, I'm leaving. So that was, uh, that was, that's why we think getting started really matters. Now that we know getting started matters, we have other things that we did, and that Sandra will work on. Okay, so with our documentation, something needed to be done. Um, initially, um, our docs were um, a collection of pages that had been written by anybody and everybody who had the time to sit down and write something. There was, the style was inconsistent, there were a lot of errors, empty pages, broken links, and not too many illustrations or diagrams to brighten up the pages. Um, troubleshooting was basically a how-to page with links to several of the other pages. So in order to make this look better, as Caitlin just mentioned, we started with the Getting Started page. Um, similarly, um, we started um, sections like the user guide, tutorial, concepts, deployment, um, and made sure our community page was clear and had direct links to where everybody needed to go to join our community. Um, we also very recently started to embed videos from our sync ups, take little excerpts of them or little demos and embed those in the documentation. And very soon we'll be incorporating a style guide across the whole set of the documentation. So that's um, in the works. Basically, to be successful, we think we, that every feature needs to have documentation 
for without documentation, the feature just, just does not exist. It has been said that good documentation is very, very good, but when it is bad, it is better than nothing. Also, incorrect doc documentation is much worse than no documentation at all, and we don't want to be there. So we're, we will um, start looking at um, metrics, and we'll take a bit of a deeper dive into those. Um, let's start with our blogs. So blogs, uh, the first blog for flight was published in March of this year. It was basically an introduction to flight. We later had three blogs released in April, a couple in May, and then one over each of the summer months, and then two um, this month. So when we uh, so the blogs are basically announced over Twitter, Slack, um, our LinkedIn discussion group, and um, the Google groups, in addition to most recently our homepage. So if we check our Twitter activity, so taking the months of May and September as examples, we were able to notice um, that on the exact same dates where the blogs were published, we had a jump in the activity. So May 13th, May 25th, actually May 13th might be that one, May 25th, and then September 2nd and September 9th. So we were able to see a direct correlation between the dates when the blogs were released and Twitter activity. Bearing in mind that we announce almost everything on Twitter, so things like our sync up, any announcement, our releases, everything is always on Twitter in addition to the blogs. So that seemed to be working for us. Moving on to um, Google Analytics, we're going to refer back to that second quarter that we mentioned in the social media journey. So right about March, April and May is when we started the big um, documentation revamp, getting started and everything. So we can clearly see the more we worked on our documentation, the more peaks we have in the just general acquisition. And also traffic acquisition seems to reflect the same trend. So the more we worked on the docs, the more uh, peaks we seem to see. Over the summer, when things slowed, slowed down a little bit, so did the peaks. And judging by that final section, looks like we need to do a little bit, we have a little bit more work to do. So we have that um, in mind. The more we sharpen our docs, the more blogs we publish, and the better we tell the world about what we are doing, the more activity we can see. That's kind of where we're at at this point. Also, um, engagement. Uh, we, have, we were able to see that it was directly related to our documentation revamp. So when we started in April, there's that little jump right there when our getting started was updated. Um, the other documentation followed, and then our YouTube SEO was improved around this time in June. And then when we finally had most of our documentation in shape, we see that uh, peak up there. So again, when we slacked a little bit over the summer, we could see a little bit of a drop. And then when we picked up again in September, those peaks over there uh, seem to reflect that. So it's good to be able to see that when we do work on the documentation, we do see direct um, correlation. Um, GitHub stars is another one, um, another metric that we measure. Um, it's a little bit tricky because it's not a measure of how many people are actually on your repo. It's more how much they like the project or how much they think the project is interesting. Some people will actually star a repo because uh, they want to bookmark it for later reference. So it doesn't really show. There's no way to know why people are giving stars. There's no way to measure that. So even though there are some limitations, we're still able to see that large jump when we first released around the beginning of 2020 and also another jump up here when we um, started to improve our documentation around that second quarter right there. It might be more useful when you have a GitHub repo to check the number of forks, issues, commits, and PRs to judge um, or to be able to measure um, how active your, your repo is. To date, we have 25 repos on flight. So yeah, go ahead and check us out sometime. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, at this point, we're able to comfortably say that Slack remains our number one communication platform. We had tried other channels to build a community and reach out to people. Discourse did not have traction at all, unfortunately. And then uh, when we started the LinkedIn discussion group, the trouble with a discussion group is that you can't share posts exter externally. They just stay within that group. It's not the same as having a LinkedIn group for a company. That way you can share. Um, so that hasn't been extremely um, helpful, um, although we still continue to, um, to post uh, to that group. Um, we tried to establish a community on GitHub discussions, but we noticed that the discussions are always referring back to Slack. So they start on Slack, they move to GitHub, they go back to Slack. And when you want a more immediate response, you tell them, go back to Slack, somebody will respond almost immediately. So that's still there, but it's not terribly useful. And with Google Groups, we do send out all our communication there. We know we have some members, they're steadily increasing, even slowly. But there's no way to get stats for that. There's no way to measure um, how useful it is. You send an email out there, but you don't know how many people are reading that email. You don't know if they find it useful or just send it to trash right away. So um, we, still <laughs> we are continuing to do that, but it's difficult to measure um, how effective it is. So we're going to stay on Slack. We're going to focus on that as our main communication platform. Over the past two years since it has started, we have been averaging about 120 real-time messages every day. So it's extremely active. Um, responses are almost in instantaneous. We have about 550 members at this point, over 20 channels. The only disadvantage for this Slack uh, that we have right now is that it is not free if you want to keep record of more than 10,000 messages. So. We know a lot of useful discussions will be lost, unfortunately, but that's something that we have to either live with or figure out what we want to do with. But for now, it seems to be working. We're getting a lot of um, traction on Slack. As for outreach, uh, Twitter seems to be our number one platform at this point. So everything we do will we'll go on Twitter, and we are about uh, close to 200 followers at this point. Now, with regards to our contributors, we've been able to see that um, at this point, our contributors span 112 countries and about 1,500 cities, uh, which is really humbling, as Kaden had said, uh, to see how far an open source project can reach all these people. Even if it's one or two people in a city, it's still outreach. It's still um, widespread. Um, again, activity with the users where I was peaking during that quarter, April to June of this year, fell a little bit in the beginning of summer and it's starting to pick up again. So that's, uh, that's a good sign. And then this is again consistent with documentation updates and mindful um, social media marketing. Then we decided to look at Lynx Foundation stats, LFX, and we noticed that our contributor strength has increased by almost 400% in these last two years, which is great. But this graph is a bit more interesting to look at, our contributor growth and retention. So when Flight was first announced, we see that our active users are steadily increasing, which is wonderful. What hit here was COVID. So February 2020, everybody stayed home, or probably around March. So that's when activity started to drop a little, and our inactive users increased a lot. Um, by the end of 2020, um, everybody was kind of figuring out how they worked at home, how things are settling in. Activity started to pick up again, and our active users were slowly increasing again. February 2021, March 2021, that's our quarter there. That steep increase is right there. And our, active, our um, inactive users are slowly decreasing. So we did cross that point again where our active users are much more than inactive users. So looks like we're uh, heading in the right direction. We should keep going. I'll hand over to Kaden for contributor um, confidence and a couple more slides. Um, just one clarification, the previous one, I think the previous one was contributors, essentially people who are contributing in terms of code or some sort of uh, thought process. And the one before that was users who are 
or our, some definition of users who are able to come and look at docs and so on. Um, so for the contributor confidence, like, you know, contributors are, it's extremely, are extre it's amazing to have contributors in the project. It's humbling. It's, uh, you, know, you start a software project and you're like, hey, I'm writing code, but you know, I want to open source it. And the reason why you open source it is because you want to get more people to contribute to it, right? Um, so contributors are extremely important for the success of a project. And contributors only can come through if they're confident in contributing. And, and confidence is a very hard metric to measure, but we think we can, uh, we have some qualitative measures on it. Like we think if you don't have too much documentation on, uh, and not enough insights into your project, I'm, there are still some contributors who come in and contribute, which is just fantastic because they go and read the code. But there are many others, it's just inaccessible to them. They just don't know where to contribute because I think the vast majority of the engineering population in the world is still on closed source. They, they don't really, they're not as open to contributing to open source. I think it's converting, but still it's a, it, it, it remains a reality. Um, moreover, like if they, they will not contribute if, if you know, they, they check in something and it breaks something. Once that happens, it kind of puts you into a shell. And, and you lose the contributor. So you have to make sure that the, that confidence goes higher. And to, that, for that to happen, there needs to be you know, simpler ways of making sure that the quality of the code that's being checked in is it's high. Now that could be based on code reviews, but code reviews are extremely hard. Like for a project that has 25 repos uh, and has like lots of code in different languages, it's, it's extremely hard. To, to get a full coverage with code reviewers. It, it really has to be programmatic. Uh, and, and one of the things, the other things that we realize is that there are many contributors who come in who try to solve their one problem because they are like, hey, I was using this and I found that mm, this one thing was missing, so I'm gonna fix that. And that gets checked in. And, and this is extremely true with the integrations. They integrate. And then they go away because they, are, they got what they want, they're using it, and it's working for them. But who is responsible for, responsible for maintaining that it continues to work? And that's the community and the core team and so on. So we, we think having high coverage and you know, constant tests is the only way to do this. And especially for products that are trying to integrate with a lot of things, it's actually, it's actually much harder. If, if I was to choose something, you would, I would choose not to integrate with too many things because it's much easier to maintain quality. When you start integrating, you have to, you're dependent on other things and their APIs and their interfaces and their breaking patterns and so on. And, and hence it is essential then that somebody needs to do the constant test for all of this. And then, and if you're running constant tests, that's not cheap, it's very expensive. You have to run them on, on Kubernetes clusters, on cloud providers, and on-prem, on GPUs, especially if it's a machine learning project and so on. And that becomes extremely expensive. But, but we are trying our best as a community to constantly keep up the contributor confidence. Um, and some of our decisions, design decisions help in that. Like we are spec based and like constantly based on like everything is first specified and then uh, implemented. So that helps us in maintaining some of the confidence. I guess one of the last things we realized is like positioning. And this is a very, it's a soft topic which people don't really realize, uh, and we, we definitely did not. Like when we open sourced, we didn't have a tagline for the project, and we didn't know if it really mattered. And I can honestly say it does matter, right? Um, so when we first open sourced, we were like, okay, what should we call this thing? We were like, okay, it runs on cloud and Kubernetes, so let's call it cloud native. It's used for data and machine learning, so let's call it data and machine learning platform absolutely the wrong thing for the system. It's not a machine learning platform, it's not a data processing platform, because if it is, then it's like, it's everything. It's too big of a thing. And this misleads people. When they come in, they're like, oh, I expect it to do X, Y, Z, and it does you know, something else, potentially. So, and we realized this quickly, because we got wrong questions. And then we're like, okay, how do we correct this? And again, not enough of a thought process. We were like, okay, let's you know, kind of course correct. So we said, accelerate your data and ML pipelines to production. 
part of part of it is the truth, right? Like it's a pipelines, and you want to do in production uh, and data and ML. But it's extremely vague. It's not clear. It's not obvious. And so then we did another positioning exercise, and we were like, okay, what? And we talked to a bunch of folks. We talked to the community. We tried to understand. And then we said, okay, this is why people are coming here, and this is what we should talk about. So we said, it's a workflow. There is a workflow engine component to it. It's a workflow automation platform. And what are people using it for? Data and machine learning processes. And, and the reason why they come to it is because of scale. So we make it like that. And, and we also realize they only come to it because it's been used in production for a long time, while many of the competitors are not, not used in production. So we're like, okay, we'll add all of this. But then we again got some folks who are like, oh, I want to run this. I don't have Kubernetes. How do I do it? Oh, okay. So we had to you know, further course correct. And we were like, okay, we should put Kubernetes in there. So this is the final thing that we came up with. And some of the others, uh, their competitors, like they, they say we do X, Y, Z, you know, other stuff. It's kind of confusing instead of showing that it's like you know, the breadth of the product. As engineers, we want to show that it can do 100 things. Uh, but instead, and that becomes very confusing for the users. They really care about the two things, and they like when something does those two things well. Uh, so that's how we decided to position. Uh, and I think it's fair for the users. It is the right way to reach the right set of people, and it helps uh, in, in actually reducing the wrong questions and assumptions. All right, so that was the quick history and story of us building the community, but I will hand it over to uh, Sandra for you know, talking about our future plans. Thank you, Kaitan. We have just a couple minutes left, so we'll go through this uh, quite quickly. Um, our next steps um, are broken into community outreach and what we can do with our documentation, like the technical side of things. With our community, we're going to try to um, encourage our users to write uh, blogs instead of having us write them um, every time. Uh, we are looking at uh, releasing a newsletter ne next month, um, focusing on Slack and widening our LinkedIn um, outreach. We um, are also thinking of joining uh, a group called Talk Openly, Develop Openly and collaborate with um, both um, other open source projects and uh, many um, integrations. As for our product and user experience, we will continue to better our documentation, um, clarify our roadmap, streamline the user experience um, by showing them better ways to get started, better UI, and also remind them of any software upgrades that we have and any specific uh, versions of software they should be using for a streamlined experience. In the long term, we have a Flight 1.0 coming out, um, and only two integrations to go to uh, graduate as a top-level uh, project in LFAI um, and data. All that in addition to our performance improvements. Um, there will be three other sessions uh, that Flight will be uh, giving at OSPACON. There's one today, uh, one Tuesday, and one on Wednesday. Uh, Niels um, is with us actually today. He'll be uh, presenting um, this evening. Um, and we are participating in Hacktoberfest um, next month. Um, join us on Slack. We have a channel there for Hacktober, and a blog will be coming out soon. So thank you for joining us, joining us everybody, and we are open to your questions. Any questions? Anything that we can help answer? Yeah. And of course, we'll stay around for you know people want to do one-on-one -on -one questions. Hi. Uh, yeah, so uh, Amrita, the question here is, if I, if I may repeat it, um, is uh, for the con contributor confidence, if you have tried on an onboarding process of some sort, uh, as well as mentorship programs. So uh, I'll answer them in two parts. Uh, for onboarding, yes, we, we do have a contributor guide. We, uh, for every repo, we have tried to improve um, how you can contribute to each one of them. We centralize all our issues onto one. 
um, one repository so that people know where to go and look for other things that are happening. Um, and we, the documentation uh, in general, usually the code is documented. Our code is written in Golang for most of it. And then we have our user libraries written in Python and Java and Scala. So, so we, we do get contributors from different language sources. Um, but uh, to answer mentorship, like we, we are like we, me and a few other folks do help folks. Absolutely, we do like Zoom, Google Meets, uh, any time they they want questions. But we don't have a formalized mentorship program, and we would love to. We, I guess we did not have that big a community till recently. Again, not big right now, but like we actually can have some mentorship because and and people have contributed to different parts now. And so there would be enough depth and breadth in people that they can help mentoring that. But that's a fantastic suggestion. Uh, I think we would love to uh, definitely put that in there in our contributor doc, essentially, to say, like, hey, if you want to mentor and you want to contribute to something, click this button. That's, that's a fantastic suggestion. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Django, and I actually work in community development for open source projects. When you were starting like opening it to the the general open source world and developing your initial open source community, what resources did you have available to work with there? Um, so I was at Lyft. Um, Lyft did not really have an open source program office of any sort, but it had Matt Klein, <laughs> who was, I guess many people know him. He um, is the person behind OnY, uh, and, and, and Lyft has been a big contributor to open source in the recent years. Uh, so the only thing that we learned is essentially through, through uh, talking to other folks who were either contributing or opening up their things, and, and we learned a few things. There was, I didn't know, but I, maybe I didn't look enough, so, but I didn't find a talk that were just like, there's still such these things, these learnings, that's one of the reasons why we put this talk together, essentially, so that next time when you're doing an open source project, hopefully you don't do this after a year and a half, you do it on day one, because it does really help uh, the project. Um, and, and on the side note, I'm gonna say that we, we at Union.ai, which is the company behind it, we, are, we were looking for open source community managers for the flight projects. If, if you know anybody, we would love to talk to you. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you just said, uh, my name is Yunis, I'm from U UN Foundation. But uh, you said on day one. I'm sorry, I came in a little bit late. But really define the day one. How, how kind of put together from a technical point of view does the product have to be before it's interest? <laughs> how, how early and half-baked can you begin engaging and, and have that, that engagement back? And I'm very curious about things that are more in the idea phase, coming soon, want to be a part of this. How do you, how do you begin to create um, a shared community while it's still not ready to use? Fantastic question. Um, I think your positioning really matters over there, number one. right? You, you need to be absolutely honest of what it is and what it is trying to be at the moment, not about what it's going to be two years and down the line, right? Because it, uh, like I've seen some projects where they talk about a lot of things, and when you go into the project, there's not much. And it's one way of doing it, for sure. Uh, the reason why f folks chose uh, to use us in some cases is because it was production ready. It worked in production, right? But on day one, <laughs> it was production ready still, but people didn't really want to use it because they couldn't. Um, so if your product is production ready, but it doesn't really, it's not really accessible, features don't matter, right? The, the, the completeness doesn't matter because it's like, you know, if you don't have documentation, it really doesn't exist. So that's one. Second, don't lie, right? Just be honest. I think people understand, right? The good contributors will come in and they'll look through it and they're like, I know what this is happening. Or, you know, oh, this is awesome. I really want to go behind this cause and I want to help this, you know. And, and there's no momentum like that momentum. So it's very hard to get that. But, uh, and then of course, marketing really, really helps. 
pandemic and the last year did not really help us. Um, and then lift situation and the world situation, like we, we just, it was one person driving an open source project. It's kind of impossible. Uh, so if you have enough people, I think that really helps in the beginning of the project. I hope that that was a roundup answer, but hopefully that answered your question in a weird way or no? Yeah, I've always thought about like that, that very first hurdle to get something production ready, and I think it's different for it's, every product. Yes. And to be able to incubate it in a way within Lyft is a, is a gift. A we were lucky. We were absolutely lucky. But what if, you, what if you don't have that? What if you want to get a, a bunch of like-minded engineers who, are, who want to solve the same problem, but, but really it's from scratch there? You're, you're a long way. Yeah, and I think that's a really hard problem. But I think be honest in that. Just come up and say, like, we think these are the set of problems uh, and communicate openly. Now, we do see that if you communicate too openly about certain things that you have not done. Like, we had a coming soon sections in our document. People hate that. We, we actually got a lot of negative feedback for that. Uh, so people do not like coming soon sections in their docs. Um, and, then, and then the other thing that we realized is that Sometimes it becomes over marketing. Are we out of time? Sorry. How do you manage priorities? Priorities across the pro product or? All the users, all of the contributors, they all have their own. Right? That's why the values matter. Uh, the priorities, priorities in an open source project is very interesting. If somebody comes up and says, this is extremely important to me and I'm putting three resources on it, like Spotify basically said that we wanted to build like like the Java SDK, Java Scala SDK, because they're like, we are going to use that one. And they built it. Now, for the community, there's, there's open prioritization over here, right? Like you just go in and like, yeah, sure, we'll support you in, um, in the sense of mentorship, but we can't really write code. But then other cases, they don't really have those many engineers, so they'll be like, hey, we need this. And then, then it becomes where the values really help us. Well, like, is it really going to improve the reliability or going to affect? If it's going to improve the reliability, then we actually trump that over some of the other features. Because you can create broad features, like unlimited number of broad features. But what we've also seen is Flight is such a broad product that you can have hundreds of features. 20% get used. They really matter. So let's just focus on those 20% and make sure that the 20% is stable. Are you a union I? Making those calls? I mean, no, like no. The, the TSC. The, so I'm also part so of the TSC. TSC. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. We are, we're building it. It's slow. Uh, no, not Union.ai. It has no calls. The only thing that Union.ai makes calls is like, can we offer one more person to help with? How formal is your TSC? Uh, we're just about getting started. We have uh, folks from Spotify, Freenome. Uh, some other couple other companies that I cannot name at the moment that we are creating, but we are not a graduated project, so it's not completely formalized yet. But that's part of the graduation. So we are aiming at the end of this year we have a formalized TSC with a chair and a board and so on. Somehow we already have that. So that is amazing. <laughs> uh, sometimes that might slow down certain things yeah, potentially. Yeah. I think that's why getting like-minded people in the TSC really, really, really helps a lot. And I, I don't know what community are you talking about. It's an insurance uh, okay. blockchain-based oh. framework. Awesome. Don't trust. Don't trust. Don't trust. Don't trust. Don't trust. Don't trust. Any other questions? Fantastic. I think uh, thank you for showing up during pandemic, and, and hopefully you we could share certain things with you guys. Very helpful. Thank yes. you. Thank you.